Great. Uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Goldblatt and Dr. Slater for the uh, opportunity to talk, as well as uh, Sages for the invitation. My name is Ariel Perez. I'm going to be going over inguinal hernia repair in the elderly. I have no disclosures. So what happens when you get patients in uh, this age demographic coming into your clinic? And they're coming into your clinic and they got a bulge in their groin that something looks like this. Well, exactly what do we do and how do we repair it? So we know that over 1.6 million hernias are diagnosed in the United States and over 700,000 groin hernias are repaired annually in the United States. Lifetime risk of developing groin hernia is about 27% in men and 3% in women. And the incidence increases with age, and it's estimated that about 13 in every 1,000 patients who are older than 65 years of age are going to be developing hernia. Now, the elderly population is actually projected to double by 2060, with nearly one quarter of the population being 65 years of age or older. And as of 2017, the average life expectancy is over 78 years of age. So who should we repair in this age demographic? Do we have to repair everybody? Well, there's asymptomatic and minimally symptomatic inguinal hernias, and there's symptomatic inguinal hernias, and I'd suggest that maybe we can either do watchful waiting or elective repair. And then there's the incarcerated, obstructed, strangulated inguinal hernias that probably are gonna require urgent or emergent repair. But either way, most of these patients are probably gonna need surgical repair. Well, in this 2020 systematic review evaluating surgical repair versus watchful waiting for asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic inguinal hernias in men, what they found when they looked at 858 patients, which were followed with watchful waiting, they found that approximately one-third of patients crossed over to surgery after three years, with more than two-thirds of patients crossing over after 10 years. The most frequent reason of crossover was hernia-related pain, and the rate of acute hernia-related operations was fairly low, only 2 to 3 percent. And there was no increased morbidity or mortality with watchful waiting. But when you look at these studies, the studies actually don't account for patients with a hernia that were never referred to a surgeon. So if, if you look at the Fitzgibbon study from 2013, and you look specifically at the older uh, patients, 68% crossed over to surgery um, on the watchful waiting trial, but six, uh, the patients who were 65 years or older, they crossed over to the surgical arm at higher rates, and they also had a shorter median time to crossing over as well. And in this retrospective study of the VA hospital system between 2001 to 2009, looking at over 1,000 patients with almost 1,200 groin hernia repairs, they found that age, femoral hernias, inguinoscrotal hernias, and recurrent hernias were significantly associated with emergent presentations in both univariate and multivariate analyses. Now, 53% of the patients had no prior diagnosis of a groin hernia prior to their acute emergent presentation. So maybe these watchful waiting trials have likely underestimated the incidence of acute hernia-related operations. So when's the right time, and will there ever be a better time to operate on our elderly patients? Um, in this retrospective review, using the uh, 2011 uh, NISQIP database evaluating mortality and complications of inguinal hernia repair based on age and type of surgery, what they found was that elective hernia repair is actually fairly safe with low morbidity and mortality among all age groups. But when you look at emergency repair, there's definitely an increasing morbidity, morbidity and mortality with age. In their study, they were unable to assess the effects of laparoscopy just because uh, due to the limited amount of data. As the patients got older, there was less laparoscopic surgeries being performed. They also found that the mortality um, increased with age. Uh, the mortality rate was 3.6% in patients 75 to 79 years of age, and then up to 10% in those greater than 80 years of age. So it does seem that elective repair in the elderly is preferred. And elective repair will have probably a similar morbidity and mortality to younger patients. So watchful waiting might seem reasonable, but it's limited to patients with known hernias. And elective surgery is preferred to emergency surgery. When, with increasing age comes higher rates of needing surgery, shorter times to needing surgery once a hernia is actually diagnosed, a higher risk of needing emergent repair, and with those emergent repairs comes a higher risk of morbidity and mortality. Well, what about the type of anesthesia that we use when we fix these elderly patients? We know that elderly patients have a higher risk of post-operative cognitive decline with the use of general anesthesia. And that was actually first described by Bedford in 1955 in a Lancet article. And again, it was looked at in 1998 by the International Study of Post-Operative Cognitive Dysfunction. And what they found was that increasing age and duration of anesthesia 
little education, a second operation, post-operative infections, and respiratory complications were risk factors for early post-operative cognitive dysfunction. But only age was a risk factor for late post-operative cognitive dysfunction. And then in 2008, an anesthesiology article by Monk also showed that a significantly higher rate of post-operative cognitive decline was found in patients greater than 60 years of age. Well, in this retrospective review of the Veterans Affairs Surgical Quality Improvement Program database, they looked at eight, over 8,000 frail patients undergoing elective, open, unilateral inguinal hernia repair under local or general anesthesia. And what they found was that local anesthesia was associated with a 48% decrease in the odds of developing post-operative complications in these patients. So, Looking back at these 2018 hernia surge guidelines that we've, we've referred to quite a few times, they found that local anesthesia, when compared with general and regional anesthesia, is associated with faster mobilization, earlier hospital discharge, lower hospital costs, lower total health care costs, fewer complications, lower rates of urinary retention, and less post-operative time. In fact, um, what they recommend is that local anesthesia is recommended for open repair of um, reducible inguinal hernias provided that um, the surgeon and the team is experienced with um, local injections. Now, what about regional anesthesia when you compare it to general anesthesia? Well, regional anesthesia actually might be associated with increased complications like pneumonia, blood clots, and myocardial infarction. And so the hernia surge group and their international guidelines recommended that general or local anesthesia be used over any sort of regional anesthesia. So when you think about the three types of anesthesia that you might use in your elderly patients, regional might not actually be the one that you want to do. General is actually okay, but local is probably preferred. And in terms of local anesthesia, it's, uh, it's been described in quite a few hernia textbooks, and it was, this was described in 1994 uh, by Dr. Ahmed in Annals of Surgery. It's a 50 to, um, a one-to-one -one mixture of 1% lidocaine and uh, mixed with half percent bupivacaine. And it's uh, subs um, subsequent injections through the subdermic and intradermic um, uh, uh, layers, and then a subcutaneous injection, and then a subfascial injection, and then also around the pubic tubercle and around the neck of the indirect sac. Well, what about the technique? Well, we've kind of already gone over it, and I'm just going to say, just keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. In terms of the hernia surge group and what they recommended, it seems like there's no uniform technique applicable to all patients. Hernia surgeons individualize based mostly on their own experience and scientific foundation is lacking. Groin hernia management will be based on surgeon's expertise, patient and hernia-related factors, and available resources and logistics. Now, what about laparoscopic surgery? Um, in this retrospective study of, single cent of a single center looking um, at um, over uh, 3,000 patients and over 3,000 hernias, when they compared uh, laparoscopic um, cases for patients that were younger than 60 or older than 60, they found that there was no significant difference in post-operative pain length of hospital stay, time to recovery with activity, recurrence rates, complication rates, ileus, or seroma. So lapar laparoscopy does seem to be safe in an elderly population. Okay, well, I, I told you you should probably use local. Well, can I use local with laparoscopy? I originally actually thought no, but when I did this uh, um, literature study, um, this was a prospective study from Staten Island looking at laparoscopic TEP, TEP repairs, they found in their review of 14 repairs in 10 patients um, under local anesthesia. Now, the operative time um, was actually um, uh, a little bit longer under a local, but there was no conversion to open, and there was no recurrence after one year in this study. So a laparoscopic TEP, TEP, can be performed under a local. So you, for unilateral inguinal hernias, I, I'd say ideally you want to perform this under a local either an open or an MIS, depending on your surgeon preference. For bilateral inguinal hernias, you can do this under a local if possible, or general anesthesia. Or you may want to consider doing a two-staged open surgery to be able to repair the patient under a local if general anesthesia is something that they can't do. And then in women that are elderly, you just want to make sure that you're also um, evaluating the femoral space and treating it as necessary. Well, when we're talking about elderly, we can't not talk about frailty. And 
you know, if you have a patient that comes into clinic, this is actually, uh, he's 93 years old. You're probably going to have a different idea of what type of repair you want to do with him compared to this gentleman if he showed up in your clinic. Well, what about this 82-year-old lady? You're probably going to have a different viewpoint of how you want to take care of her compared to this lady if she shows up in your clinic. So what we know is elderly patients have higher post-operative mortality and morbidity in the adult surgical population. Reduced functional organ capacity with age reduces reserve and the ability to endure stress, and that pre-existing conditions raise concern for post-operative complications related to cardiac, pulmonary, renal, hepatic, and neurologic functions, as well as cognitive decline. And again, in this hernia surge guidelines, they said in elective hernia repair, medical comorbidities are the primary contributor to cause of death and must be considered when planning operations, especially in the elderly. Now, when we think about frailty, there's going to be a lot of studies, and what we can find is that the frailty index was associated with increased mortality. We can find that frailty was an independent predictor for development of in-hospital complications and major complications, and that age and uh, ASA scores were not. And we can also find that increasing modified frailty index was associated with a stepwise increase in the incidence of complications even when adjusting for age. And so in this editorial from Geriatrics, um, what they said was a decline in physiologic reserve has important implications for the surgical patient because a diagnosis of frailty is associated with markedly increased risks for post-operative mortality and morbidity. Neither a referring physician nor an assessing surgeon should deny patients surgery purely based on their chronological age. Instead, decisions should be based with a precise picture of the patient, taking into account the cognitive, functional, nutritional, socioeconomic, and effective status. So when a patient in this age range shows up in your clinic, really think about how you would want to repair it because you probably should repair it. The elderly population in the U.S. is continuing to grow. Inguinal hernias in the elderly have a higher risk of becoming obstructed or incarcerated and should be repaired electively. Patients who are older with femoral, inguinoscrotal, or recurrent hernias have a higher risk of needing emergent surgery. Local or general anesthesia should be used, and regional anesthesia should be avoided. And a surgical approach should be based on surgeon expertise as well as patient and hernia-related factors. Frailty, rather than age, should help guide patient discussions and management. Thank you.